Proverbs chapter 8. This particular Old Testament book falls in the genre of wisdom literature. Alongside Job and Ecclesiastes, and much of it is believed to have been written by King Solomon. And it is written to his son, and sometimes we see the word sons. Dates between about the 10th and the 6th centuries B.C., and the purpose of it is back in Proverbs 1. But I want you, with your hand right here in Proverbs 8, to turn back to Proverbs chapter 1, and I want you to hear it with me. Proverbs 1, 1 through 7, so that you can get the feel of it. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb, and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I want you to turn with me to Proverbs 4, and there is a verse and a phrase I want you to underline, and with this we will have our theme. Proverbs 4, 7 says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, and whatever you get, get wisdom inside. We have come to get us some wisdom. I'm going to tell you right now why the devil so despises wisdom. Because there is absolutely no place it cannot show up. Absolutely no place. Right in the situation you were in, right in the situation you are in, no matter what situation you are in, no matter what place you find yourself, there is no place that wisdom cannot show up. There is no crossroad where it is not an option. There is no ground where wisdom cannot be found. There is no earthquake on earth it cannot erupt from. There is, you cannot go so far down that you cannot wise up. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? There's no flood on this earth where wisdom cannot be found in its wake because Proverbs 8, 35 says, for whoever finds me finds life. You've got to understand with me that our human brilliance can lead to our greatest folly. But our greatest folly... If we allow God to do what God wants to do can lead to divine, God-given wisdom. One of my best friends has a cousin that has a lot of that same kind of path that I was describing a moment ago. She just goes from one thing to another thing, to another thing, to another thing. I mean, just like disastrous decision after disastrous decision. And I have quite a lot of compassion for that because I lived in that trap for what seemed to be a very, very long time in my life. And it got at some points where it was further and further in between, but sooner or later, I was always going back to that same pattern. And so my friend nicknamed her, I mean, out of, Tenderness and a little bit of a grin, Miss Mess. And she'd just get us up to date. She'd even put it on the prayer list sometimes at work. She'd just say, Miss Mess is in another mess. And it was just like, and I thought to myself over and over again, I have been Miss Mess. Anybody else in the room? Oh, I have been her. I have been her, all right. I've been her. I don't care if you're Miss Mess, if you're Miss Lead, if you're Miss Fit, if you're Missionary, if you're Misplaced, if you're Mistreated, if you, you're Miss Deeds, if you're Miss Givings or Miss Elanius. If you feel like you are misunderstood, misrepresented, misdiagnosed, mismatched, misshapen, misspent, you may have a misdemeanor or a felony. 
You may feel like your whole life has been one big mistake, but you don't have to miss the wisdom. Anybody get it with me? Satan cannot keep you from getting wisdom. And he knows with wisdom comes the turn. No matter where you are right now, no matter where you are, the enemy cannot keep you from getting wisdom if you want it. The question is going to be, what do you really want? Because do we want to stay in that same cycle of our bitterness, our resentment, our unforgiveness? Our mean-spiritedness, our addiction, our malformed affections, or do we want wisdom? Because for somebody here and for everybody here, it's your turn to get some fresh wisdom. Go back to Proverbs chapter 8, and I want you to look at it again alongside the very first verses of 9, and then where 13 goes to verse 18, and you will notice with me that there is a personification of two women, two women that we're going to call Lady Wisdom and Woman Folly. And it's so intriguing that they're personified here in these verses. And in the words of one scholar, they share a common domain. So we have them both, a chair representing each one of them because they are sitting near one another. And what we're going to find in our lesson this weekend is that folly can in many ways imitate lady wisdom. There's a reason why the New Testament tells us that we know we're maturing when we begin to discern the difference between good and evil because what is good and what is evil is not always very clear. What is wise and what is folly needs a discernment that is very often beyond what can be seen or rationalized with the human mind. Now, I ask you as we get started this weekend with our concept, what would cause under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, King Solomon to teach the lesson through personifying two women. One wisdom, one folly. I want you to see something. Glance with me at Proverbs 1, verse 8. Proverbs 1, verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. I mean, you want to you want to cross stitch something for your son's room? That is it right there. <laughs> that would be it right there. Who is it written to? Is what? His son. It's written to King Solomon's son. And this is a young man that this is all addressed to. So understand that that is the audience. And the young man, when we get to Proverbs chapter 8 and Proverbs chapter 9, the young man is depicted in this metaphor of a traveler, a sojourner. And so his father is telling him how to recognize the difference between wisdom and folly. Now, if you were teaching a young man, Solomon was teaching a young man um, his own son about the pitfalls of life and, and would try to grab his vision wherever he was looking. What metaphors would he use but the metaphors of women? So right here we see a little bit of an insight as to why. Maybe for us it would be that it would be um, for a young woman, this man wisdom and this man folly. For this young man Solomon was teaching him he was saying to him, you want to know in this personification, the best woman you will ever find is wisdom. As imagery, as a personification that we'll come to understand through the course of the weekend, there is wisdom and there is folly and wisdom will be very, very very good to you. I want you to see something. You're in Proverbs 8. Turn with me for just a moment to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. My eyes have been in this part of my Bible for 
well over the last year because of the series on 2 Timothy. And so I read and read and read 1 Timothy as well because, of course, it is the precursor. It's the first letter. It's the second letter coming on the wings of the first. And I want you to see some wording, a place that I really didn't get to go in the study, but it really, really, really stirs my heart up every time I think about it. First Timothy 6, 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, verse 19. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Do you hear what he's saying? Paul is saying to Timothy, there is life and then there is that which is truly life and it will not be found in your riches and it will not be found in anything that you can hold tangibly, anything you can hold in your hands. There is life and then there is what Jesus called, there is abundant life. There's what Paul called in his own terminology under the inspiration of the Spirit, there is really life. There is truly life. It is a word that means really and truly, taking hold of that which is really and truly life. Now, I want to tell you something because this is very, 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 very important. And probably the biggest pers- uh, purpose we have in, in tonight's lesson is that, that we understand we have got to change our perception and widen it, not replace it. We need to add to it our perception of wisdom because what you and I will tend to do, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how many people in this room I, I could estimate who probably thought to themselves, you know what, I, I know I need it, but I wish we were studying something exciting. <laughs> because our tendency is to picture wisdom, that, that the full length of it, that it in its entirety is basically being proper, making proper decisions and just being proper about things, decorous about things. That is wisdom to us. But what I want to throw at you this weekend and get, get, get your mind out of a, this is not going to be in a context of a sensuality. Get over here in the real life meaning of the word in, in a general sense. I want us to see this weekend the wild side of wisdom. I want us to see this weekend that wisdom is one of the most provocative things I mean that in the true sense of the word that we could possibly study this weekend and it is what you want. It is what I want. I want to use provocative in the sense of what it means in that first definition out of Merriam-Webster's that says serving or tending to provoke, excite, and stimulate. There is nothing more exciting that we could study this weekend together than wisdom. That no matter how old you are, if you're 13 years old, or if you are 93, that what you want is wisdom. And that wisdom has a wonderfully wild side. Divine wild. That's what I'm looking for. Yes, yes, wisdom is settled. It's sane. It's peace-giving. It's rest-giving. But it is also full of life and adventure. And I'm going to prove it to you in the scriptures. We are here to sink our titanic misconceptions of wisdom that it is boring and it is old. And I tell you one reason why we're not excited about wisdom because we associate it with this picture right here. (laughs) Anybody? Tell me what you'd call that little, what's that little phrase that goes with that, a what? Oh, say it again. That's a wise old owl. I ask you a question, who, who? Who? When I wrote that in my notes, I got tickled at my own self. Everybody say, who? Who? Wants to be a wise old owl. I don't even know an old woman who wants to look like that. I don't know one. I don't know one. Why would we want to be that? 
that. I want to remind you, Proverbs happens to be written to a young man and then it includes from the very first chapter and then it includes, it says, then let the wise grow wiser still. It is written from the youngest to the very oldest that there is still wisdom to be gotten. You would not still be drawing breath if you had gotten the last of the wisdom you were going to need. You're not the one that already got it. There's something you've come to get, and we're gonna get it. There's a wisdom you and I need for the season we are in right now. There's, a, there's direction you and I need. There's insight. We got some people who are driving us absolutely crazy, and we need insight into them. We either need to understand them or we're about to kill them. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Understand he's going to save their lives. You come into some wisdom. It's the best thing that ever happened to your 17-year-old. Come into some wisdom. Here's what you need to know. Wisdom does not equal asceticism. Asceticism is, it sees self-denial as the measure of self-discipline, of spirituality. What, what you deny yourself. Everything's bad, everything's bad, everything's bad. Because for some of us, and if you ask me, what is asceticism? Let, let me just tell you in a basic, especially in a spiritual context, this is so um, prevalent among many believers in their thinking. Um, asceticism, and it's what, what uh, Paul talks about in the book of Colossians, in Colossians chapter two, when he says, you're talking about asceticism here. What I'm talking about is not asceticism. Wisdom knows that folly is the one that rations, that wisdom feeds. Wisdom is the one with the feast. Did you see it? Did you see it? Proverbs 9, wisdom has built her house. She has honed her seven pillars. She slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has set her table. Look at it when it says in verse 13, the woman folly is loud, seductive and knows nothing, sits at the door of her house, takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Whoever lacks sense, she says, stolen water and bread eaten in secret. Do you see what is at her table? See, here's the picture we have this weekend, that every single one of us in this room, we are sojourners. One of my very favorite uh, psalms talking about uh, the traveler, the sojourner, and, and I'm also thinking in terms of Peter, who in his um, first letter reminded us that we are foreigners and we are, we are pilgrims here, that we're, we're on our journey. Psalm 84 says that we are on pilgrimage, and that's the word the NIV uses, on pilgrimage, till each one of us appear before God in Zion. And, and here we are at a crossroad where we can go with folly or we can go with wisdom. And, and we're going to see that folly takes her seat right at that crossroad. And we're going to see in that same general domain, wisdom takes her seat right at that crossroad. Both of them are calling out. Both of them. Both of them have a table set. One is with savory food and sweet drink. The other is bread and water. Do you see our perception? Because you and I will think over and over again, to do the wise thing, I'm gonna need to go for the bread and the water. When wisdom is saying, I have set you a feast. Why have you associated with me with famine? sinking our titanic misconceptions of wisdom. A look at wisdom on the wild side. Wisdom does not equal legalism. One of my coworkers, I always throw out the concept to them and we discuss it together. They are some of the um, godliest women I know. And one of them pointed out, I, so I said to him, wisdom does not equal legalism. Let's talk about it. And one of them said, well, legalism is lazy. And I said, okay, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. What would make legalism lazy? She said, because legalism is about what you don't do. 
It's not about getting your tail up and doing something. Legalism is, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this. It's all driven by thou shalt not and no thou shalt. Legalism just wants to be right. Wisdom is about God being right. Wisdom is not perfectionism. Wisdom is not just heady. It's not just heady. I want to show you something because I love it. Proverbs 8, verse 5. Proverbs 8, verse 5 says this. Oh, simple ones, learn prudence. Oh, fools, learn sense. Learn sense. You're going, man, I love that verse too. That is, no. But what we can't see is that where it says um, sense right there, where it says learn sense, that word in Hebrew is the word for heart, for heart. Learn heart. Learn sense. What it's saying is this, that that we're not just talking about something that is in our heads. It also transmits down into our chests, into our hearts, not just heady, it's hearty. It's hearty. Somebody's going to find her heart again this weekend. Got to see Proverbs 2, 6 because it's imperative to what we're studying this week. And we're going to go a couple of places over the next couple of minutes so that we can see our framework as New Testament believers. It says, for the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. For the Lord gives wisdom. Everybody say those five words with me. For the Lord gives wisdom. Say it again. Now listen, nothing is unimpressive about worldly wisdom. I mean, there's some people out there and throughout the generations, all sorts of inventions, all sorts of things done from people that may have had zero belief in Jesus Christ whatsoever. There is worldly wisdom. Man, out of God's mercy, was created in the very image of God. There is worldly wisdom. We've known or been beneficiaries of wise people who are not believers. But this is so much more than that, that 1 Corinthians 1 basically says it this way. That worldly wisdom at its very best is foolishness to God. Godly wisdom is in such a different category, it makes worldly wisdom look like idiocy. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? We're here this weekend to get something we can only get from God. In order to operate in the way that you need to and in the way that I need to, you and I need to know and operate out of wisdom God alone can give us. He knows. He knows. Look at one another and say, only God knows. The thing about it is he wants to translate some of that to us. And he wants to do that through wisdom. You're very, very close to the book of James. I want you to turn with me there, verses 5 through 8 of chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him without reproach. You know what that means? At no time will you ever go to God asking for wisdom that he will ever say to you, you know, the thing about it is, you are such an idiot. And honestly, if you come to me one more time and ask me for, I already, I told you this before, I've shown you this before, and here you are again at no time, at no time. Let him ask God who gives to all generously. You're not going to get a ration of wisdom this weekend. You're going to get you a lot of it, a lot of it. When my daughter Melissa was a little bitty thing, she would come to me in the kitchen and she'd hold out a little hang out. And you know how precious the little, the little palm of about a little three-year-old is. And she'd hold out her little hands and she'd say to me, she'd say, whatever she wanted, whether it was cookie, candy, whether it was little cracker, goldfish, whatever it was, she'd look up at me like this, this and she would say, can I have a bunch of it? <laughs> because she thought she might as well ask. I mean, you can just go, can I have one? Or you could say, she look at me just so, with those big green eyes, can I have a bunch of it? And I just go like pouring that stuff in that hand. 
trusting God that as she grew up, she would know the difference between what would hurt her and what would bless her. And what I love about Melissa is to this day, she wants a bunch of it. <laughs> Whether it's Jesus, his word, what he has to show, relationship, joy, laughter, even tears. I'll take a bunch of it. Why ask for a little when you could have a bunch of it? <laughs> he gives to all generously and without reprimand. But it says in verses 6 through 8, But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord since he's a double-minded individual, unstable in all his ways. Listen carefully to me. This, this, what the scripture is telling us is this, that you and I, when we lack wisdom, we can ask for it. I mean, ask for it. And we will get a bunch of it, but we are to ask in faith without doubting. And what God's been teaching me when I began to learn these verses, particularly when I was studying the book of James for the Bible study, when God began to put this on me, I began to always couple my request for wisdom with gratitude immediately, immediately. Every time I ask God for wisdom, virtually every time I follow it up by saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't wait to get it. I'm going to get it. I can't wait to get it. Because he doesn't want us to doubt. You need right now, right now to settle in your mind. You have come this weekend to get wisdom and you're going to get it. You're going to get it. And not because you're such a good getter. Because God is such a good giver. Anybody? God is such a good giver. You lack wisdom. You are in the right house this weekend. Wherever you come from, whatever situation you're in, whatever is on your mind, whatever conflict you've got going on, you are here to get wisdom. Don't you doubt it for one single second. You ask him for it, and you believe you're going to receive it, and you will get it. May the Father of glory give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Spirit of wisdom and revelation. I'm about to show y'all something so fun. Now, here's our deal. You and I have to make a deal in the house this weekend because wisdom stretches all the way from Genesis 1-1 to the very end of Revelation 22. I mean, it is a, a principle throughout the scriptures. Um, Jesus Christ himself was the incarnation of wisdom. He is the very wisdom of God. So it's a huge concept. So there's no way we can get our mind wrapped around biblical wisdom. So what you and I are going to do is that we're going to settle most of what we're doing right here on Proverbs 8 and 9. So we're going to learn a few things. Somebody listen to me. What did I say? How many things? We're going to learn a few things about wisdom, but those few things could change everything. Oh, I, oh I'm, I'm going to wait for somebody to get that with me. We're going to learn how many things about wisdom. But those few things could change what? Everything. Everything. So I'm just going to throw this out at you. Here's our definition of wisdom. Skilled living from treasure hunting. What areas are involved and can be touched by godly wisdom? Because it would seem like it would just would be religious things, right? Well, no. Because that is why wisdom sits at the city gate. That is why Folly sits at the city gate because everything inside the city can be affected by wisdom or folly. Everything, everything, absolutely everything. Think urban, think city, a place of life, all socialization, education, government, commerce, architecture, community, family, everything within it. You do not have the one life, the one set of circumstances, the one adolescent, the one sick parent, the one diagnosis, the one job, the one vocation that cannot be profoundly affected by wisdom. Wisdom turns on its ear. And to turn something on its ear is to change something in an exciting way. 
For instance, uh, we might say, it doesn't even have to be a good exciting, it could be a bad exciting, it just is exciting. Um, the, The internet has turned our way of life on its ear. Social media turned relationships on its ear. Technology, from generation after generation, turns the world on its ear. Wisdom turns on its ear. Where am I getting that? Eight, six. Look at Proverbs 8, verse 6. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. The NIV says, listen, listen. We stand here, and I love this picture because it says folly just sits. Folly sits and is loud from the chair, but we're told that wisdom stands and cries out. Every time we stand at that crossroad, all we have to do, turn that ear. What is it you want me to know? Where is it you want me to go? It begins with listening. If we are not good listeners, we will never be wise people If we always have to do all the talking, we are not doing the learning. Okay, I got to show you something. Oh, I love this so much. I'm just asking God. I'm asking God for the wisdom to even teach this next portion in such a way that will not be confusing or easy to twist and turn. Go with me to Proverbs 8, verse 12. Now, we've already met wisdom. She's calling out from the crossroad. And it says in verse 12, this is the same wisdom. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. And I find knowledge and discretion. Prudence is not a word we're really in love with. Isn't that the truth? Like prudence. Like I'm really praying. Like how can I pray for you? Prudence. (laughs) I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, we, we want to be modest people, but prude I don't know, it's just so close to prune, I think. <laughs> Prud- but you know what prudence is? Because it's actually a fascinating word in the Hebrew. It can be a negative or positive word depending upon the context. So the context decides whether it is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, the word that translates prudence in Hebrew in a bad context, in a negative context, means someone who is scheming, someone who is tricky. But in a good context, it means someone who is shrewd. It it would be what Jesus was talking about when he said, I want you to be as innocent as doves and as shrewd as serpents. It would be the ability, prudence would be the ability to be able to find your way out of a maze. It would be the ability, the God-given ability. Some of you are in a situation you need out of, you need out of. I mean, you need to escape out of it. And God has a way of escape for you. And you need to trust him. Now, I'm talking about if it's godly, if it's an ungodly situation, and you are in harm's way. You know the kind of thing I'm not talking about and the kind of thing I am talking about. I'm not talking about when we're just frustrated with who we're living with. I'm talking about when we need escape. And wisdom provides exactly step by step one Step at a time how that's going to take place. Go back with me to verse 13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is right. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness, 19. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. Look carefully, verse 22. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. Possessed who? Wisdom. The first of his acts of old, ages ago I was set up, at the first, before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, before he had made the earth with its 
fields or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. He drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his commands, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, there I was beside him, like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of man. Now, I want to say something to you tonight very, very clearly. In the New Testament, Christ is wisdom incarnate. But what we have in Proverbs chapter 8 is imagery, not incarnation. It is critical that we understand the difference between imagery and incarnation. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. It is, we cannot even be saved if we do not believe that. If we believe that he just came in the spirit and it appeared to be flesh, it, 1 John says that that's a deal breaker, a deal breaker. There is the incarnation and then there is imagery. In Proverbs chapter 8, what we've got going there is pure imagery. It's not typology. He is speaking, this is King Solomon speaking of the gift that was given him in 1 Kings 3, 28, when he asked for wisdom. Now, we've already seen wisdom turns on its ear. This is gonna get fun right here. Number two is wisdom is a world with wonder. Remember, you and I are sinking our titanic misconceptions of wisdom. There is a playfulness and a wonder that is recaptured in knowing something and grasping something and having skill at living in some area that they could not have known without God himself. The young, the old, there is a playfulness that wisdom makes room for. So in, in this imagery, think of it this way. Remember, imagery, not incarnation. Wisdom is interacting with and reacting to what God is performing through her. So this is, it's all just a, a word picture that is being placed on the page before us. It's the revelation of God's brilliance displayed in creation. New American Commentary puts it this way, Dr. D.A. Garrett Woman wisdom does not personify an attribute of God, but personifies an attribute of creation. She is personification of the structure, plan, or rationality that God built into the world. Okay, I'm going to put this in, in real layman's terms here. See if, if you can go here with me. That, that, that God is allowing on this page, under the inspiration, wisdom, it is as if it's being personified to watch what God is doing with it. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? That everything in creation, God was creating out of divine wisdom. So here is this wisdom in Proverbs being personified as watching this whole thing. Remember, imagery. But picture this with me. Wisdom saw creation spring into existence, ex nihilo, out of absolutely nothing. Chaos comes to order. Light pierces the darkness. The earth is formed and God turns it on its axis. An estimated 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Try to wrap your mind around that. The wisdom that sent all these planets spinning that, that caused dry land to separate from the seas, that suddenly grass is sprouting and flowers are blooming and there's like birds are flying and fish are swimming and whales frolicking. Anybody understanding what I'm saying? The stripes on zebras and the spots on leopards, the shells on turtles, the fur on panda bears, the tails on monkeys, the utters on mothers. I, I had to <laughs> because it was really a wise thing, a wise thing that God gave mothers utters. <laughs> <laughs> 
then wisdom like watches in wonder as God takes soil from the ground and starts working it in his hands and he forms this body and all of creation looks at it and goes, just imagery here, just a metaphor here. Man, that is some kind of weird animal. No feathers, no fur. And suddenly it takes form and it's this human. And God did something different here because he took the soil in his palms, warmed it, formed it form the body of the man, then he gets down and gives that dead body CPR. And that chest starts to rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall. And that dead gray skin starts getting pink and lively. <laughs> Welcome to the wild side. Listen, I got to tell you something, nothing on the earth will age us faster than folly. Nothing will take some years off of our insides. I'm not talking about our outsides. Our insides, our hearts, and our minds. Like wisdom. You want to hear something crazy? That word that's translated rejoicing or by the scholar playing. It's the same word in a different form used in Proverbs 31 about the Proverbs 31 woman laughing at the days to come, laughing at the future. Do you guys, any of you remember any context in which Isaac was uh, sporting with Rebecca, his wife? That's the same. It's a form of that same word. And it meant that he was caressing her, maybe tickling her, hugging her, flirting with her. It's widened the whole concept. And do you see the fun in the word? Here is what I want you to hear. I want you to understand with me that when God, by his wisdom, created this entire universe in a way that it actually works and stays put, when he created an earth that actually keeps spinning on its axis and is the only known planet in the entire universe that can sustain human life. The wisdom of God, the wisdom of God, when he formed fearfully and wonderfully the human body and the way it works. Does anybody get that with me? But I want you to understand that we, as a work of his wisdom, are a delight to him, a delight to him. And do you know when you and when I, a people flawed and prone to folly, actually do get a little bit of divine wisdom, that God is actually happy about it. Can anybody in the room picture that God could actually be happy about you? And then he doesn't just go, rub his hands through his holy white hair and go, finally! <laughs> but that wisdom rejoices when it falls on a human heart and makes a skillful decision. My daughter Melissa reminded me of this quote by G.K. Chesterton in Orthodoxy, it says this, and I'm quoting him, the more I considered Christianity, the more I found that while it had established a rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. We're going to find out something about folly and wisdom. We're going to find out that folly is what keeps us trapped and that wisdom is what gets us out of the house without us destroying our own lives. Brings us to number three. Wisdom exists to engage. 
I, I, I love this because it means that it's the foolish that need to be locked in a room and it is the wisdom that get to go out into some of the places where they can actually take it and engage culture. I think about Dr. Russell Moore sent into the world of government by God right there in D.C., a, a man that, that confers with, with the president and with um, people in high places of government. A world, a godly man can enter under two conditions, if he is wise but not wise in his own eyes, and if he is wise enough to know he is not beyond being foolish, wisdom exists to engage, to engage culture, conversations, debate, community, creation, science, mathematics, but its specialty is relationship. I'm gonna tell you something as we close, listen. It is never too late for the foolish to become wise, and it is never too late for the wise to become foolish. Never. We can be wise and get to be 85 and suddenly play the fool. We can be 18 and be wiser than our teachers, but we will probably never know it because wisdom is not wise in our own eyes. We've established the point that wisdom and folly are seated at the city gates and that everything beyond that city gates, when it's talking about that kind of urban living, community living, that everything back behind it can be affected by wisdom and can also be affected by folly. So I want you to think this through with me so that we can just make this point together. So you're gonna hold it down. How many of you in the room work outside the home? How many of you in the room work inside the home? How many of you work outside and inside the home? Uh-huh, this is one busy group and I get that in every way. Anybody in the room have a relationship that is really trying you right now? Could I see your lights, please? <laughs> okay, any of you at your wits end with A or members of your family? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, can I ask you a question? Does anyone in the room lack wisdom? All right, all right. So see, this establishes it because what I want you to understand with me today, remember if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I'm in a creative work, I'm in graphic design, um, I'm, I'm an artist, I'm in, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an interior designer, there really is no place, uh, we're not really talking about something that affects that. Untrue. Do you remember that the first place we saw wisdom in action, the wisdom of God in action, and then it's, we're seeing this personification of, of, of Lady Wisdom reacting to it and just watching what God does with his wisdom. Uh, remember, the first context was in creativity. How many of you are retired? Can I just see your hands up, please? Retired. Listen, you need tremendous wisdom about what you want to do with your retirement. Tre tremendous wisdom. You're not done needing wisdom. You need tremendous wisdom. You need tremendous wisdom if you're grandparenting and you are so worried about how the thing's going that you don't know what to do. Anybody hear what I'm saying to them? There, there is no place you are not involved in the one kind of work that does not flourish under godly wisdom. What would, if you're a fiction writer, what would happen if you really began to ask him, Lord, I mean, work a wisdom in me, a creative wisdom in me. Show me, show me, bring me that storyline. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whatever it is, wisdom. We're gonna ask him and we're gonna believe it, we're gonna receive it. Now, Proverbs 9, let's read uh, Proverbs 9, verses one through 18, please. Wisdom has built her house. She has honed her seven pillars. 
She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table and sent out her young women to call from the highest places in town. I want to pause there just a moment because I want to talk about the seven pillars. I just let's put it, put it to the side right now because it's going to distract us. And it's a beautiful thing anyway. Wisdom has, has built her house. I love the idea of building and honing, that she's honed her pillars because it's giving us, it's conveying the idea of a progressive work. So often wisdom is that to us um, in Christ, in that in in season to season to season to season, we are forever needing fresh wisdom. Last year's wisdom about what to do in that situation, it served us well or either if we were in folly with it, folly betrayed us just as it always will. But we're not in that situation. We are in this one. And what will we do with this? So there's this progressive, this building, and then there's this honing and it's all this picture of wisdom. Now, scholars say that the uh, seven pillars have been told to represent any number of things. Highest probability they represent the seven pillars since it's just talked about God in creation in the previous chapter. In all likelihood, it's probably talking about the seven pillars being just the habitable world, uh, that just the foundation of the world, that the way God created the world. There's another really, really good theory that maybe it is the seven days of creation. And if that is so, I want to say this to you because if that is so, wouldn't it be interesting if that seventh pillar is the pillar of Sabbath and rest? Because I'm going to tell you something. We are not going to be wise people if we don't know how to rest. Sabbath, I, I, we are not under the Old Testament law, but I will tell you this. We are still under the, the um, divine law of a body and a mind that needs to rest. Now, some people need to get up. But is that fair to say? Because some of us, we've got the rest thing going. We just hadn't gotten up in a while. But others of us, we need to lay down. Now, you know, I have ideal, one of my thorns in the flesh is that I have a really bad back. And I have just dealt with it for years. And it just is anywhere uh, on a scale of, of 1 to 10 and a level of pain, it just goes up and down and up and down. And I mean, I've had years in this last 10 years that it just never stopped, never stopped, never stopped. And it would be pain. And then it would be ache. I, right now, I live with a really strong ache a lot of the time. And I just, it's just part of my body. I just had another set of MRIs and I could explain to you all the things kind of going wrong in it, but it just, it just is something that I'm dealing with right now, praying for healing through it. And also just if God does not um, determine in his wisdom to remove it, that it'll also uh, be something that I'll be able to uh, bear up under and be victorious through. So just all that weighing with the Lord. But one of the things that has um, come to me by way of help is a woman at my church who has, a, who has scoliosis. Um, was able to learn medically some things she could do, some stretches she could do that would be good for the back. And they had brought her out of a life of pain. She said she lived in it all the time. And she said, I do not live in pain like I used to. So she is training me right now. So once a week, she comes to the office for 40 minutes, and I wear my little yoga pants, and we have a sort of what you might think of as holy yoga down there in one room of the ministry in the floor on our mat, and it's just one-on-one, -on -one and she plays godly music. A lot of it's just instrumental, but I need you to understand the atmosphere because I go like this all the time. I talk fast, I walk fast, I run fast, and my idea of a workout is aerobics. I want my heart to beat fast. I do, I mean, I am, we're just mm, 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 constantly, constantly. My music's up loud. That is the way I live. That is the way I'm happy. So 
Uh, when it's time for me, it's like, they'll call me up in the office. Uh, Ann's downstairs waiting for you. So I'm like, I run down there, run down there. Well, all the way down there, my staff knows that they've got about two minutes while I'm getting down there. They ask me everything under the sun. They're literally walking beside me all the way in. I go in there, like, and, and I walk in where Ann is. I go. <laughs> because Ann wants me to slow down. <laughs> and she hardly talks at all, and she's very quiet, and I have to get in certain stretches, and I have to hold it <laughs> for three minutes. The reason why I don't do it on video is because I'm not holding anything for three minutes. Only thing I'm holding for three minutes is my grandbabies. That's all I'm holding for three minutes. I'll hold them a whole lot longer than three minutes. I don't have time for stretching. Does anybody else understand what I'm saying to you? I don't have time for stretching. I don't have time for stretching. But she gets me in all these weird poses, and then I have to hold it. And then at the very end, I have to have four minutes on my back, four solid minutes, the longest four minutes of my life. She sits over me and watches me. Four minutes where I just lay there to some really beautiful music. And she says, Beth, try to relax. She said, Beth, is your tongue pushing real hard in the roof of your mouth? I just want to go, what business is that of yours? <laughs> she said, rest your jaw. Rest your jaw. Beth, I need you to rest. Could you just re did you rest and breathe? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Do you know why I keep doing it? We just keep doing it week after week. Because honestly, it has been one of the most revolutionary things I've ever done in my life. I don't know how it's doing for my body, but I'm going to tell you this. I, I never stop. I never stop. And just to lay there and go, my God, I rest before you without sleeping. This thing right here belongs to you. Overtake it and apply every single scripture you have ever taught me to the health of my bones. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We got to have us. We got to have us some rest. It says in verse two, I want you to get this with me. She has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. We're going like, well, that is absolutely gross. Absolutely gross. But it means for her table. It means like she's got the roast there on the table. Maybe the gravy. I love roast and mashed potatoes and gravy. So I'm picturing that. I'm picturing how it smells. She's mixed her wine and I'm, for many Baptists, I feel absolutely sure that it's non-alcoholic wine. <laughs> at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to know all the Baptists at the table when the angels come to pour the wine and we all go. <laughs> okay, she has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Okay, you know what occurred to me? It occurred to me that sometimes wisdom will call out to us through someone else. Sometimes we'll reject the wisdom because we don't like who gave it to us. <laughs> we don't like them. We don't care if it was good advice or not. We don't like them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, you don't want to do it because they are the ones that told you you should. But sometimes wisdom sends out these people to make the invitation. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days will be multiplied, verse 11 says, and the years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. Verse 13 introduces back to us the woman folly. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. Now, here's what I want you to see. Make the comparison back to woman, um, to lady wisdom. 
because this is fascinating. Watch how many things they have in common. When it says that the woman folly is loud, she is seductive and knows nothing. See that she's loud and we might think, well, well, lady wisdom is quiet. Well, no, wait, 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 wait. Eight, one, does wisdom not call, does not understanding raise her voice? What is the difference there between the two? We're gonna try to discern it in just a moment. She takes a seat at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the high places of the town, calling to those who pass by. So here we've got wisdom, and here we've got folly, and both of them are making invitations. Now, when we're coming into that city gate, and we'll, we'll use that as uh, whatever our current situation may be that we, where we could really use wisdom. When we're coming, in, we don't always know the difference because there are a whole lot of things that look similar. Both of them have set tables. Both of them are saying, come on in. Both of them are saying, if you're simple and need, um, and need something, turn in here. It says, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, verse 16, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Folly indulges in security. Folly indulges in security. If there is anything we want to get through in the next couple of minutes in this room, it is that insecurity, girlfriend and guy friend, this goes for men and women both. Insecurity is not your friend. It is not your friend. It will betray you over and over and over again. Any decision you are making out of insecurity will lead you to folly. It will lead me to folly. Let me tell you something. We are just rife in our culture with jealousy and insecurity because of all our social media. Now, I love social media. I'm, I'm on a couple of different things. I'm not on a lot of it because I have to choose um, what I want to do and what I'm going to give my time to. The ministry is on Facebook in my behalf, but I'm not. All I do besides that is Twitter, and I do some blogging. The reason why I do Twitter, and this is what I'm talking about, sometimes we just got to figure out what am I doing here and what is it that sows into what I'm doing. Well, for me, Twitter, because it's about words and not pictures. A writer uh, draws pictures uh, not with a camera, but with words, and so I like that. I like that, but, um, but what it's done to us is that we're buying all this bull out there and we're thinking everybody's living this big adventurous life. We have no idea that some of these really, really marvelous people are dealing with things like irritable bowel, <laughs> post-nasal drip. You might know what I'm talking about that they get stomach distress, and that's as far as I'm going to go with that. But I'm just saying, sometimes it, it really is important uh, for us to understand uh, that all of these things are in play. Lisey got the sweetest gift from somebody here uh, for her, her baby, and in that darling little outfit, underneath it was a box of little drops for, for when babies get gas. And it's like, that just goes to show that they're so darling, so cute in their outfit, but they're going to blow that diaper out and it's going to ruin that outfit. <laughs> blow that diaper out. You know exactly what I'm talking about because this is real life, but it, we're just like, we're just like rife with jealousy and insecurity and it wouldn't take social networking. This, listen, I want, please just let me speak to this just a couple of minutes because there are women in this room. I've been here. I've been here and this is why I want to talk about how miserable it is where you're watching your husband to see if he's looking at someone. And man, it, it especially hits close to 40 because there's a little bit of a freak out going on there. And then you're looking to see, you know, I mean, is he, who's he, is he looking at someone? Is he looking at someone? Here, here where can I sit in wisdom? Okay, listen, y'all. This is not going to be easy for somebody to accept, but I'm telling you right now, this is the only way to live unless you want to be miserable, unless you want to be absolutely miserable. I don't know if your husband is going to look at someone else or not. 
I don't know if he's going to look at them, or, and maybe that's all he's going to do. Or maybe if he's going to look, and then he's going to want to touch, and he ends up being not only unfaithful of mind, but unfaithful of body and heart. I don't know what will happen. I hope none of that will happen. Much of what we fear never happens. But this is what I'm going to tell you. You can't stop him or control him with your insecurity. It won't affect any of it. Even if you harass him and harass him and say, it ruins dinner. Am I talking to anybody? It ruined your date because you were almost positive. He looked at the young woman's legs at the next table. Is this the way? you want to live. You say, but he was. I can't help it. You're going to be miserable if you do not get a grip. You're going to be miserable. What if you said to the Lord, you know what, Lord, if he's doing the wrong thing, have at him. (laughs) Have at him. I'm going to tell you what submission is. I'm going to dock, as Dr. Evans said, I'm going to dock and let you hit my husband. Somebody, I need somebody. Have some relief today because it's not doing you any good. You are completely miserable and you're acting, you're taking on omniscience because you're saying you can read his mind and you cannot read his mind. You may say, I can read his eyes. I know what a man of lust he is. You know what? At what point does your jealousy become as big a sin as his lust? This is ridiculous. We need deliverance. We need deliverance. For some of you, it's your girlfriends. Like you've got some friends. You are so jealous. You've got a really good friend that now is hanging out with another friend and you think they're getting together without you. (laughs) And you're all up in it. All up in it. The worship leader's acting like somebody. You were the one on the team. And now somebody else is getting to sing more than you are. It's no way to live, jealousy and insecurity. Insecurity and jealousy will never endear anyone, never. It's miserable to us, and people are repelled by it. am, Am I saying anything that's fair to say in the house today? We need deliverance today. We need deliverance. We need a confidence in who we have been called to be in Jesus We are told in Hebrews chapter 10 in verses 35 and 36, do not throw away your confidence because it will be greatly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you may be richly rewarded. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? Be confident. Who has he made you to be? Listen, we're so jealous of somebody else's gift, we have not developed our own. You you know why? Because we're trying to develop their gift. We're trying to develop somebody else's gift. We have seen their gift. We have beheld their gift. And we are trying to develop their gift. And we are imitating their gift. (laughs) And we had our own gift. We had our own gift. We had our own gift. If you are exactly like your mentor, I mean exactly, then I have some questions to ask you. Are you operating out of her gift or your gift? I say it was the same gift. You know what? It may be the same gift, but it's on a different person with a different background, with a different strand of DNA, with a different history. You bring something marvelous to the mix. Use what you've got. Use what you've got. Use what you've got. Look at one another and say, use what you got. (laughs) Is that enough on jealousy and insecurity? You know, I will say this one more thing. I never despise myself more than when I'm letting myself go with some jealousy. Anybody? I never, I hate it. It's my worst, it's my least favorite feeling inside myself. I'd honestly rather be, now not devastated, but I'd rather be a little sad, just a little sad. I'm I'm rethinking this as I say this. (laughs) But I hate being jealous. Die to it, die to it, die to it, die to it. I never despise myself more than when I'm letting myself go with some jealousy. Anybody? I never, I hate it. It's my worst, it's my least favorite feeling inside myself. I'd honestly rather be, now not devastated, but I'd rather be a little sad, just a little sad. I'm I'm rethinking this as I say this. (laughs) But I hate being jealous. Die to it, die to it, die to it, die to it. Now I want you to notice something. Notice that all the noise in verse 13. I told you that we were coming back to it. Remember, wisdom calls out, but folly 
is loud. Woman folly is loud. What, what in the world is that about? I want you to notice something here. I, I think this is very interesting. See that, that term, um, woman folly is loud? Look at Proverbs 121. Now, the beauty, beautiful thing about Scripture is when Scripture, when you use Scripture to teach Scripture, that is a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous way uh, to teach. One of the things that is just even more beautiful and more fitting is when you can find a term in the same book, in the same book that is written by the same inspired writer. That is even more of a beautiful thing. Look at Proverbs 1, verse 21, where it says this. I'll start at verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. So see how loud? So what, what, wait, wait. What's the difference? We got loud and loud. What makes folly loud in a different way than wisdom is loud? That's the question on the table. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. Noisy, you see the word noisy? That is a form of exactly the same Hebrew word that is translated loud for woman folly. She's noisy, she's noisy, she's noisy. Let me tell you something that's go going on in our day. This is not any kind of a, of a newsflash. We, we all know this. There's just so much noise. Just noise, noise. And I'm even going to translate what all we're looking at on social media. When we're, our minds never rest, never, met, ne never rest. I mean, honestly, we are just living with me, myself, and iPhone. Anybody? Anybody? And I mean, just in all the noise and all the outrage and all the, we need to do this and here are three steps to this. And this person has said this and this person has said this and, and all the noise and all the noise and all the noise. Network news. I'm not saying what they're saying on network news is folly. I'm just saying it's noisy. Anybody get what I'm saying? Where they're all yelling over one another? And I'm just like, speak one at a time. <laughs> this is, if I want you to all speak on top of one another, I will watch Parenthood reruns. I'll watch Gilmore Girls. Noise, noise. Listen, if we don't get some quiet, we're not going to hear the voice of wisdom. We're not. Let me tell you, we're not going to get wisdom from God by checking our Instagram every 30 seconds. We're probably, listen, I love, I love social media, but wisdom from God is probably not going to drop down from Facebook. As my friend Chris says, get your face in the book. I'll give you Facebook. Get your face in the book. That's you, some Facebook, because we need wisdom. We're going to die one of these days. We're going to die one of these days, and we're going to have taken up all this time with noise, not using our phone to have real-life conversation with somebody, but just on stupid social networking. It's just dumb. It's just dumb. It's just a lot of noise. Number four is this, and it's huge to us, just huge. Number four is this. <laughs> when I say huge, I always think of Keith because my husband does not put the H sound on huge. He goes, it, that fish was huge. <laughs> and our family is from Houston, Texas. And every time he says one of these words, the girls and I look at each other because we love him so much, but he is such a character. And I find myself constantly going, this point is huge. It is huge. This one really is huge. It's number four, wisdom prizes insight over ego. What's number four? Say it to me. Wisdom over ego. Now, remember that insecurity we were talking about a moment ago and that jealousy? What, one of the things that God is teaching me to do, I'm very much a work in process, but he's teaching me to do it, is to trade something off. And it's really hard to give something up and have nothing in its place. That void, then we don't, like, what do we do with that? It's like, uh, you know, it's like emotional smoking. It's like we've been doing that thing and doing that thing and doing that thing, and we still want to reach for that cigarette. We just want something to do with our hands. Like, I can't imagine not drinking coffee, not only because of the way it tastes, but I don't know what would be warm in my right hand. 
Honestly, I'm just being honest with you. I cannot comprehend. I cannot comprehend that I'm going to write for hours and hours and I'm not going to edit staring at that screen with a warm cu coffee uh, cup in my hand. I can't even imagine it. We, we get this addiction and we, this is taking up all, insecurity is taking up all this space and jealousy is taking up all this space. And what do we do with it? Well, we trade it in. And the insecurity trades for humility. Trade it. Trade it. Let, let, let it become humility. Jealousy, let's become jealous for someone, for their very best. Start praying for them, for God to bless them. Je jealous to know Jesus. Uh, uh, jealous to know, to know his truth, to be set free in him. Wisdom prizes insight over ego. Now, Melissa does, um, my daughters, Amanda and Melissa, are just, you talk about a prize to me. I cannot even tell you, they're my best friends in the entire world they are the, um, so often the main voices that I listen to. I, I cannot tell you how I grow from them, how they keep me up on things, how, uh, how much I learn from them. But when, what Melissa does for me when I come to an event like this or write a Bible study is that she comes from the very academic side of things. Uh, she can read the, uh, she does, she uses primary sources for language studies. I use secondary. In other words, I, I know how to read Greek, but I don't always know what I'm reading. Melissa reads Greek and she knows what she's reading. Melissa can read Hebrew and she knows what she's reading because that's her thing. That's her thing. So she does real technical um, articles and she'll get in the real technical side of things and she can look for something like I can say to her, wisdom and folly is, um, is my theme this particular weekend. Go and see if you can drag up some good dissertations on that part of, of Proverbs chapter 8. Does that make sense to you? That's the kind of thing she does. Well, she was just all over these three verses right here. She said, Mother, they're my favorite ones in the entire uh, portion. Look at this. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, verse 7. He who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in his learning. Here, you remember last night when I told you that uh, wisdom is not perfect? perfectionism. Look at it. See, wisdom still needs reproving. You, you can be a wise person and still need to be reproved about something. But we'll, what will show your wisdom is what you do with the reproving. Because this is, I love this point so much. Uh, she was the one that gave me this point. She said it to me, and I said, I'm taking it down, and I'm going to share it with him, and I'm, I, I'm going to um, I'm going to tell him exactly where it came from. Because she said, Mother, this is what I'm seeing in the passages. That what makes wisdom different from folly is that if wisdom learned something from the reproof, it was worth it to wisdom. Because wisdom wants to learn. Is anybody tracking that with me? That if wisdom got insight, if wisdom learned something from that situation, if wisdom came out with some understanding about how human nature works, how even our own nature works, then you know what? It's worth it to wisdom because wisdom prizes insight over ego. And what, what happens so often is that we get a blind spot. Wisdom deals with a blind spot. Jesus had his own term for a blind spot. It's called log in your own eye. <laughs> Why are you taking the tweezers to a speck in someone else's eye when you've got a log in your own? Wisdom regards the log. Wisdom is willing to say, I just dare you over the next couple of days to ask God, would you tell me, where, where's my blind spot? Where's my blind spot? If you're saying, well, I've known what my blind spot is for a long time, that's not a blind spot because you're not blind to it. That's called disobedience. <laughs> that ain't no blind spot. That's I know it and I'm just doing this anyway. That ain't no blind spot. We don't know what the blind spot is until we see it, until we see it. Wisdom receives correction. Hebrews chapter 12 is talking about a divine discipline. And uh, none of us want it. And even those verses say, you know, we don't find discipline pleasant at the time, but it has a great harvest. So we really do want it. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And 
One of the things that he had to get through to me after a season of tremendous despair and self-destruction and defeat, I went through such horrific self-condemnation and consequences. I mean, the consequences were just like, I, for a while I thought they'll never end. Some of you in here feel this way. You feel like These, <laughs> this will never end. For the rest of my life, I'm gonna be paying for this thing. For the rest of, for the rest of my life. I'm gonna tell you something. Jesus already paid for it. Jesus already paid for it. He paid for it on the cross. Any discipline of Jesus is to teach us and heal us. I want somebody to get this. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 12. I want to show you proof of this. This was one of the most important things I have ever learned and am still learning it says in verse 11, Hebrews 12, for a moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed but rather be healed. Listen carefully. The Lord is not trying to break you where you never can even walk straight again. He is bringing you through this season of hardship, of learning what the repercussions of some of those uh, decisions have been so that we will be trained by it and so that he can heal what was already broken, what already got us into the mess in the first place. Does some, I want somebody to get that with me, that even in his discipline, he still, does not punish us in the way that we would deserve. He is teaching us and training us how to get out of a pattern that is going to totally destroy us if it does not get broken. Wisdom sees through seduction. Wisdom sees through seduction. Wisdom sees through seduction. Listen, Seduction is very different. Satanic seduction is very, very different from regular warfare. Think of it this way. A regular a satanic warfare is hardball. Seduction is curveball. It's, it's placing a bet on your insecurity and your desire to be wanted or valued. Uh, not all seduction is sexual. It can be for power. It can be for money. It can be for position. It can be in all sorts of ways, but it is the, the seductive part of it. It is the sexy side of satanic warfare, and it is what folly uses. Come, sit at my table. Sit at my table. And that draw, that draw, playing off your weaknesses, knowing exactly where you are uncovered by your armor, exactly where that Achilles heel is, exactly placing bets on your weakness and my weakness over and over again, taking advantage of us in our most vulnerable moment. I cannot tell you on the blog survey that I took when I said, what is the most foolish thing you've ever fallen for? I cannot even tell you how many of the testimonies were about getting into all sorts of illicit relationships. I, I, can't, I couldn't even begin to read them all to you. I just want to read one to you. I know this woman. I did not know she had walked through this. She is a powerful woman of Jesus. Powerful woman. I want you to hear some of her story. Uh, th this is what she fell for. A married man telling me that he loved me and I was his soulmate that he was gonna get divorced so that we could get married. And I was just sick enough to believe him and desperate enough for love that I hung in there for 10 years, maybe even a few months longer. Fool that I was, idiot, good grief, the lies I believed and the lies I told myself, I didn't even need Satan's help at all. If it feels good and feels like love, then it must be love. And poor him to be married to such a dreadful woman. 
I will love him, she said, out of that dreadful place. This absolutely blew my mind because she said, this is after I had said yes to Jesus Christ. She said that she was teaching fifth grade Sunday school at the time and that she would even pray for help in the matter with this man. She was, okay, help me. She was trying to get God to help her be really wise in the way she was gonna conduct her affair. Do you see how twisted around this gets? Listen, folly does not lead to fun. It does not lead to fun. Wisdom feels the warning. I'm gonna tell you something. If you got, if you are, if you are a living freak show like I've been in my life, and you're scared of everything under the sun about relationships, then you don't get to say. I mean, you're gonna say I'm flagging over everything because you flag over every relationship you're in. Everybody, you're like I think there's something wrong with him because you are suspicious of everybody you're around. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you get a warning, when you get a warning, and you cannot even rest, you don't even know why. You just know that there's something about that relationship that you're getting warned over. It could, it could be same-sex relationship. It could be same gender. It could be anything. It could be a work relationship, whatever it may be. We're, we're getting a warning, but we do not back off. Take your warning. Wisdom takes a warning. Wisdom is not afraid to love. Wisdom is not afraid of difficulty in love. But when wisdom gets a warning that there is folly, wisdom backs off, even if wisdom cannot explain to the other person why wisdom must back off. Anybody getting that with me? And be sure it's not our folly instead of theirs. Sometimes it may be ours. I felt like, because I was all ready to teach this point today, and I felt like God really put on my heart this morning that there is a woman in this room that is trying to seduce a man at work. You may think, well, I'm not trying to get in the bed with him. I'm just having fun with him. Seduction. It's a woman in this room trying to seduce one of the ministers at her church. Trying to seduce another woman's husband. I don't throw this at you out of naivety, nor am I scandalized by it. I'm telling you that this is the world we live in that is so infiltrated by sexuality that the whole world is already living in a state where we're on the edge, on the edge of such stimulation of our carnal senses that the distance to that pit is that quick. This is a, oh, I want somebody to receive. I want somebody to receive this. One of the most wonderful rites that Jesus gave his life on the cross for is repentance. It's our best friend. We get, listen, in the morning, my friend Christy asked me on a podcast not long ago, what, what is some of the, what is one of the miracles uh, in your own a mundane everyday life? I said, I I'll tell you one, getting on the floor in the morning and I confess my, I give him praise. I confess my sins to him. I pour out my frustrations and my sins to him. And I try to get specific with him. And I said, and then I get up pure. See, my, because I don't think anybody's getting that with me today because we would be happy about that. No, what I mean is I get up completely clean, completely clean, like I repented and I got up. That's a miracle. Today's a great day for repentance because let me tell you something, some of those things, I mean, they're destruction to us. If you were in an, in an affair with anybody besides your spouse. Today is the day to stop 
God wants to make you a wise and mighty woman whose life matters for the sake of the gospel on this planet. You are a woman of dignity. If you are in Christ, you are a saint. You have holiness on you. This is not like you. This is not what you are called for. As the apostle Paul says, this is not the way you learned Christ. Today is a day for repentance. Wisdom knows folly can kill you. Wisdom knows folly can kill you. This is a day, sister, this is a day to turn from our folly. Brother in the house, this is a day to turn from our folly to Jesus. Because wisdom knows folly can flat out kill you. I was so floored. I don't really know anything about Mobile except the spiritual aspect of it, that you are great um, people of God and so anxious for the Word of God and for worship. But I, ca I came to see one of the major uh, pictures, the art that is done for Mardi Gras here, that's the picture of folly chasing death. And I, I would say biblically speaking, not only is that on target, but it's not strong enough. Folly is dragging us to death. It is dragging us to death. Did you see those words in Proverbs chapter 9? Stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant, but he does not know that the dead are there that right behind this chair in the house of folly. See, we're told in Proverbs that like a person that keeps returning to their folly is like a dog returning to its vomit. There, here's the three things sitting on the table of folly. There is water, there is bread, rationing, and there is our own vomit because we keep going back and back and back and back into the same folly. That chain needs to break today because behind the door of that fine folly is a pile of skeletons. And that day is over.